Can you hear me? Okay, let's uh, get started. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Hoda. Uh, I'm going to be filling in for Professor Krause for uh, today and tomorrow. Uh, he, uh, he is out of town now giving an invited talk at a conference. So uh, yeah, so we are going to continue talking about neural networks. Uh, so in the past couple of lectures, you've learned uh, about uh, neural networks. So you've learned about how to uh, do forward propagation, back propagation, and so on. And at the, I, I, I believe at the end of previous lecture, you guys started talking about other practical problems that arise when we are uh, working with neural networks. So I'm going to start with a uh, sh short overview of uh, what you've seen so far, and then we are going to continue talking about some of the practical aspects of working with neural networks. Okay, so at a high level, remember that neural networks are represented by computation graphs like what you're seeing on the, uh, on the slides. So basically, you have an input layer where, uh, where uh, the network um, is fed with the uh, features feature values, then uh, these inputs go to hidden uh, units. There could be more than one hidden unit, and then at the end, you're going to have an output layer, which is going to tell you what uh, your uh, prediction for the given uh, input is. So uh, how, did we, how did we train neural networks? So remember that neural networks give us a very rich class of models that we can pick from given access to the training data set. So remember, with the training data set, we are given access to uh, data points of the following form. We, have, uh, we know the feature values and we know the corresponding Y value, the target variable. And the goal is to optimize the weights on the neural network in order to, uh, to be able to make prediction on uh, future instances. So remember again that uh, in a neural network, the weights are the only parts that you want to learn. The nonlinearities themselves, which are represented by this activation function phi, uh, this, these are fixed nonlinearities. So these are not things you want to learn. You fix that, you fix the structure of the network, in particular how many hidden layers you want to have, how, many, uh, how you want them to be connected to one another and all that. And then all you want to learn from the training data are these weight vectors. So how did we do that? The same way that we, uh, that we used training data for previous models that we worked with, right? So how did it work? We defined a measure of loss that was supposed to measure the goodness of fit for a given uh, setting to the parameters. And then we would use the training data that we have in order to find the parameters that minimize this notion of loss. For instance, the loss could be the perceptron loss, it could be the squared loss, in, in case you're, you're doing regression, it could be hinge loss, and so on and so forth. So uh, this, this was just the general learning framework that we have seen over and over so far. Okay, so, uh, so previously, like for instance, when you're working with linear models, uh, Finding the parameters that minimize the notion of loss is easy because what you're left with when you write down your optimization problem is a convex optimization problem, which you can easily uh, solve and uh, efficiently and exactly get a solution. But when you're working with uh, neural networks, what happens is that because of all these nonlinearities that you're introducing, the, the final loss is not a linear function of your parameters. And as the, it, 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 sorry, not linear, it's not a convex function of, function of your parameters. And as a result, it's not immediately clear how you want to optimize the loss. Uh, okay, so we saw that even though the resulting loss function is not convex, one can nonetheless use techniques from uh, convex optimization in order to find good local minima. So remember that if the function you're trying to optimize is convex, you can always, um, you can always find the global optimum. 
But when your function is non-convex, you're going to have all these other local minima that you might get stuck with if you use an algorithm like gradient descent. Okay, so uh, anyway, we saw that if you use uh, gradient descent, in particular uh, stochastic gradient descent, you usually end up uh, in good local minima. Uh, remember how uh, stochastic gradient descent worked? You would start with an initialization, let's say a guess for what the weights should be, and then at each iteration of the algorithm, you would, put, uh, you would pick a data point at random, you would compute the gradient of the loss function with respect to the weights at that particular data point, and then you would take a step in the negative gradient direction. So uh, what, you, uh, what you actually learned about in the previous session was how you compute this gradient here, right? And we also talked about how to set the learning rate. So this learning rate basically specifies how big or how small your step should be in the negative gradient descent. Okay, so uh, there, was, there was a quick note, I believe, in the previous lecture in which you were very quickly introduced to deep learning probably a lot of you have heard about this. This is a very popular and active area of research in machine learning these days. And at a high level, all deep learning is, is working with very deep, multiple layers, uh, neural networks, and there are many different variations of them. We are going to talk about one particular one, CNNs, or convolutional neural networks today. Uh, and other than that, we are going to talk about some other empirical issues in training uh, neural networks. Okay, so, so uh, if, with the back propagation, we saw how we should compute the gradient, and then we talked briefly about how to, in, to, how to initialize weights. Today we are going to talk about when we should terminate a stochastic gradient descent when you are, we are trying to train neural nets how we should choose the parameters uh, of the model of the stochastic uh, gradient descent and how we should prevent overfitting. Okay, so uh, remember that in order to compute gradient, we use backpropagation, and the way backpropagation worked was as follows. So when you wanted to compute the gradient of the loss function with respect to a weight vector w, j, and i, what you did was that you computed the error signal where the error signal is basically how much the total error changes when the input sum of the unit uh, j is changed, right? And then you multiply that by the output of the previous layer. So this was basically a, an iterative and uh, a nested application of the chain rule. All, this is all it was. So remember that in order to apply gradient descent, you want to compute the gradient of the loss function with respect to all the weights, WJIs, and in order to, uh, to compute the gradient with respect to a particular WJI, there was this nice recursive formula that you could use, right? So this was all that back, back propagation was. Okay, so there was also a matrix form, which is more compact, uh, of this uh, backpropagation algorithms, and um, it shows how very neatly back, back, uh, training neural nets basically reduces to doing matrix vector multiplications. And uh, so again, all you do is that you multiply the error signal from previous layer by the weight vector uh, and the gradient of the activation function. Okay, so. Uh, the nice thing about this back, back propagation is that it nicely corresponds to the hardware architecture, uh, the, the, matrix, uh, the matrix multiplication uh, part of it uh, can be easily parallelized because of uh, using certain hardware, and that makes it very efficient. Okay, so this was, this was an overview of back propagation. Uh, in the, at the end of last session, we also talked about how initializing the weights is going to play a role in the local optima we end up in if we are to uh, train neural nets using a stochastic gradient descent. So we saw a demo, I believe, in which 
uh, depend and when you run a stochastic gradient descent over and over again, you would get different decision boundaries corresponding to different uh, uh, different uh, weight vectors that uh, you learn as a result of applying uh, stochastic gradient descent. And uh, each weight is realized due to a different initialization of the weights. And uh, as a good strategy, we saw that uh, one, uh, one good heuristic that often works in practice is to do random initialization for stochastic gradient descent. So for instance, in this first part, you, you see that you can, uh, you, uh, you basically pick Wij from a Gaussian distribution. So uh, another, uh, another trick that we talked about was the fact that you want to make sure that the variance of this Gaussian distribution from which you sample your initial weights is uh, proportional to the inverse of the width of the layer. Why is that? Because when you have a wide layer, the number of things that you feed into the hidden unit is going to go up. And for that, you want to you want to you, you, you want to kind of be invariant to that, and as the result, you want to pick these weights uh, from a normal distribution with variance that is inversely proportional to the width of the layer. So that was that was the general idea, and you uh, might want to repeat this multiple times in order to avoid getting stuck in a poor local optimum. So you do it multiple times, and in order to decide which one works better, you basically do uh, cross validation. Okay. So one thing to remember about all these is that these are heuristic approaches. There is no guarantee that they are going to work, but in practice, they usually work pretty well. But again, there are a lot of knobs, there are a lot of parameters that you need to set, and, for, uh, and you need to validate them and make sure that you are picking the right parameter value. Okay. Uh, that's it for the overview, I guess. So today, in this lecture, we are going to talk about a few other practical aspects of working with neural networks. In particular, we are going to talk about how we can make sure gradient descent doesn't get stuck in a bad local minima. We are going to talk about how we should set the learning rate, eta. We are going to talk about learning with momentum, which is another strategy to make sure we end up with a good local minima. Uh, we are also going to talk briefly about how all these local optima of our highly complex non-convex uh, optimization objective look like. Uh, we are going to talk about overfitting. Uh, remember that neural networks have potentially many, many parameters, even potentially more than the number of data points that you have. And so it is very likely that you might overfit. So that's, that's a very important problem to take care of when working with neural nets. And finally, we are going to talk about how to make the neural net itself robust against certain transformation of the input. And uh, just to give you a flavor of what we are going to talk about, so consider a, a data set of images that you want to classify, right? So if you, and let's say they are digits, right, handwritten, handwritten digits. So if you shift around these images, you kind of want your algorithm to still give you the same classification, right? So if, if I shift around a, a two, a handwritten two, then ideally I should get the same uh, classification. I should, I, the algorithm hopefully should give me two as the, cla uh, as the class this uh, particular image belonged to. So that is, that is the type of, uh, that is the type of invariance that we are going to talk about in particular, and as I alluded to briefly uh, earlier, we are going to talk about convolutional neural nets, which are a particular architecture of neural nets that are widely used for image processing and image recognition. Okay, so this is, this is a summary of what we are going to talk about today. With that, let's get started with uh, learning rate. Okay, so again, remember that with the stochastic gradient descent, what we do is that uh, whatever our current weight is, we are going to pick a data point, we are going to compute the gradient of the loss function with respect to uh, the weights, 
given uh, given the current weights and the uh, and the instance we've picked from the input data, and then we are going to move in the negative gradient uh, uh, direction. But how wide of a step should we take? That is something that this parameter eta is going to tell us, and we call that the learning rate. So remember that if you are uh, using uh, gradient descent to uh, optimize a convex function, there are a lot of theory that tells you how you should set this uh, learning rate and um, in order to make sure that uh, stochastic gradient descent quickly uh, converges. But, but again, when we're, we're working with neural nets, the objective function that we're trying to optimize is not convex, so it is not really clear how we should set the learning parameters. So one uh, strategy that is often used and works well in practice is to start with fixed learning rates, for instance, uh, 0.1, and decrease it slowly after several iterations. So here is how, actually let me change the color. So let's say this is the, on the y-axis we have the learning rate. On the x-axis, we have number t, or the number of iterations. Okay, my apologies for being a bit slow with working with this. So basically, one particular schedule that we might want to use in order to set the learning parameter could look like this. So we start with a value C1, which is 0.1 in this particular example. Up to some point, we continue taking steps of size C1, and then we slowly decrease it, right? At a point C2, we start decreasing. At a point uh, T prime, we start decreasing it. So there is also this other parameter we want to set that uh, tells us how this part is going to look like. So again, these are parameters that you might want to fiddle around with in order to uh, figure out what works well. So this is, this is one way of setting the ADA parameter or the learning rate that works uh, pretty well in practice, usually. So another important insight that one must uh, yep. Uh, well, there are many. Um, so, so the question is, why do we pick this particular uh, schedule? Um, there, you could potentially go with other schedules. This is one particular strategy or heuristic that often works well in practice. Doesn't mean that you can't try other things. So that's, uh, yeah. So, uh, okay. All right, so another thing that you need to take into account when you are trying to set the learning rate is that you want to make sure that this Steps, uh, step size that you're choosing is appropriate given the magnitude of the current weights. What do I mean by that is uh, the following. So if the magnitude of the, weight, the current weight vector that you're working with is high, it's probably okay to take bigger steps, but if the magnitude of the weight vector itself is very small and you're taking huge steps, then that's, that's potentially a problem. So what you wanna do is that you wanna monitor the weight change relative to the magnitude of the, you want to you wanna monitor the, uh, the ratio of the learning step with, uh, compared to the magnitude of the weight itself. If it's too small, you should probably increase the learning rate, and if it's too large, you would want to decrease the learning rate. Okay, so these are a few potentially useful strategies or heuristics when setting learning parameters for stochastic gradient descent on non-convex 
uh, loss functions. Okay. So another useful trick that uh, often works when we want to make sure our gradient descent doesn't end up in bad local minima is learning with momentum. This is a uh, commonly used extension to the training module for, uh, with a stochastic gradient descent, and it allows you to skip local minima. So the idea at a high level is that in, what you want to do is that you want to not only move in the negative gradient direction, you also want to take into account the overall direction you've been moving towards in the past couple of iterations. So what do I mean by that? So let's look at... Uh, okay, let's... Consider the following plot. So let's say the function we are trying to optimize look like this. So if you run stochastic gradient descent uh, starting from this point, you're going to end up in this local minimum. minima. If you start from here, you're going to end up here. If you're going to start here, you probably end up here, and so on and so forth, right? Depending on your initial, uh, depending on your initialization, if you're on, you run stochastic gradient descent, you're going to uh, end up in different local minima. Now, the idea of learning with momentum uh, is the following. So imagine if I have a ball here, right, and I let it roll down this uh, hill, right? So it wouldn't stop in this particular local minima because it's going to gain momentum as it, as, it, uh, as it moves downhill, right? So it's going to continue going down. And that is, that is pretty much the idea of learning with momentum. So what you want to do is that you want to make sure that you, you move in a direction that is a combination of the uh, negative gradient, but also you take the velocity into account. The, let's say A is the direction you've been moving in the previous directions. You wanna, you wanna, the new direction you want to move in is a combination of the, uh, the old direction and the negative uh, gradient direction, right? So that's the idea. So for instance, now, if I start here with this learning with momentum approach, what's going to happen is that I, I come to this local minima, but then I continue moving. Why is that? Because the gradient here is pointing in this other, in this direction, right? But because, because the function is pretty flat here, you when you also take into account the direction that you've been moving in the past, you're going to continue, the, the, your, the, the stochastic gradient descent is going to continue move downhill. The, is that clear? So that's, that's the idea of learning with momentum. So the, if this is your gradient at this point, right? This is gradient of W. And this, this is A, basically. So again, here M is a parameter that you need to pick. So this is the idea of uh, learning with momentum. One thing you can do in order to set this friction parameter M, let's call this friction in order to be consistent with the ball rolling downhill analogy. So again, you might wanna start with some small value, let's say, Um, I don't know, 0. 0.5, and later increase it. So let's say 0. 0.9. So again, you might want to have some kind of schedule for this one as well. All right. So this was this was another useful trick to use in order to make sure your stochastic gradient descent does not end in uh, bad local minima. 
So this idea is not only useful in making sure that you end up, yep. Mm -hmm. Since we, we kept on going downhill, mm -hmm. how are we going to go up again? Mm -hmm. And then what if there is another... Uh, so that can, that can certainly happen. And again, these are all heuristics. So there are, for all of these heuristics, you can come up with pathological cases in which they perform very poorly, right? So and what you described is one situation in which the learning with, with momentum might in fact be worse than learning without momentum, right? But, but again, in practice, that usually doesn't happen. In practice, learning with momentum usually uh, gives you better local minima. Yeah. Okay, so, so again, learning with momentum is not only useful in finding, in usually finding a good uh, local minima, it is also useful in preventing oscillations. What do I mean by that? So on the, on the left side, you see the level sets of a convex function, and you see how stochastic gradient and how gradient descent is going to perform if you start from this point, right? So in each, in each iteration, you are going to move perpendicular to the level set, right? That is, that is, where, uh, that is the direction, uh, the negative gradient uh, direction. So you're going to keep moving, and uh, you, we know that because this function is convex, eventually we are going to end up in the, uh, in the uh, minimum of the function, but this is going to happen after a lot of oscillations, right? So, if, so this is with no momentum. Whereas in this right uh, figure, if we add a small amount of momentum, let's say 0.1, the amount of oscillation is going to be reduced, and as a result, gradient descent is going to converge much faster. So this is a strategy that has multiple good effects, uh, hopefully. Again, not always, but uh, most of the time, these tricks work well. Okay. All right, so all these strategies that we've been discussing so far are motivated by the fact that when you run gradient descent in order to train neural networks, because the loss function is not convex, you know that you're going to end up in local minima as opposed to the global minimum, right? So uh, in this next slide, we are going to talk about uh, how the local minima actually look like for this very complex loss function that we are trying to uh, minimize. And we are going to gain some insights about this by talking about some of the symmetries that uh, we have in the uh, weight space when we are trying to optimize uh, the weights. So we are trying to find the weights that optimize the loss. Okay, so let's do this with a very simple example. Let's say we have a very simple neural net with, let's say this is the input, this is the first hidden unit, the second hidden unit, and this is the output. Let's say the weights are specified as follows. We have W1 prime here, W2 prime here, W1 here, W2 here. Okay, so the function that this neural network represents, again, recall, is the following. It is W1 phi of, we, it is actually, let me, W1 V1 plus W2 V2, which is equal to W1 phi of W1 prime X plus W2 phi of W2 
2 prime x, right? So, so note that if I now permute the weight the weights, right? So if I swap w1 with w2 and w1 prime with w2 prime, I'm going to end up with a similar neural net, but with different order of the parameters. So I have V1 here, V2 here, I'm permuting the, uh, W1 prime and W2 prime. So here, instead of W1 prime, I'm gonna have W2 prime. Here, I'm gonna have W1 prime. Again, W1, W2, right? So if I swap the weights, this is the network that I'm going to end up with. And note that the function that this new uh, neural net is representing is exactly the function that this old one was representing. Why is that? Because again, here f is w2 v1 plus w1 v2 is equal to w2 phi of v1 now receives uh, x through this weight w2 prime. So it's going to be w2 prime x plus w1 phi of W1 prime x, right? So this is, this is exactly f as we saw above, right? So this, this is one source of symmetry. So again, like it doesn't really matter which one of these. So, so for any parameter setting, if you permute them, you're going to end up with the same function. So that's, that's the whole point. And that is one source of having a lot of local minima. Because for any local minima that you have, if you permute the weights, you are going to come up with a different uh, local minima, but the, fu the function that these two points represent are basically the same, right? So this is, this is one source of having many local minima. Uh, there is also another source of uh, symmetries and as a result, non-convexities, and that comes from this activation function phi that you're using. So uh, let me see if I can fit it here. All right, so let's consider the 10H activation function, for instance. Remember how 10H looked like? So here we had Z at phi, and the way the 10H function Locked was the following. So here you had one, and here minus one. So if B of Z is the ten H. We have a, an, 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 an activation function that is symmetric around the origin, right? So in other words, what I mean by that is that phi of z is equal to the negative phi of negative z. So is that clear to everyone? So basically, if you just reflect the function around the origin, you're going to get the same thing, right? So. In this previous example, that means if I negate W2 prime and W2, again, I'm going to get the same function, right? So this is, this is again, another source of symmetry. So if I replace W1 prime with minus W1 prime and W1 with minus W1, I get the same function. All right. So, so these are some of the sources of non-convexity, but note that these are somewhat benign in the sense that, okay, there are a lot of local minima, but it doesn't really matter which one you end up with as long as they represent a decent function, right? So if, if, you, if at the end of the day this local minima is good, it doesn't matter which 
permutation of the weights you get, right? Um, another important thing to notice is that if, so what this discussion tells you is that if the only local minima that you have is also a global optima, using a stochastic gradient descent, you are actually going to get the global, uh, the global optima. You are actually going to minimize your loss function. Right? Again, again, there could be multiple global minima, but you're going to get one of them, and that's good enough. So, so, these are, so this argument was meant to give you an idea of how the, uh, how the local minima, the landscape of all local minima look like. Okay, with that, we are going to start, okay, oops. <laughs> uh, okay, with that, we're going to start uh, talking about overfitting. So uh, recall again that when working with neural networks, we potentially have lots and lots of parameters. The number of parameters could be even larger than the number of instances you have in your training data set. And as a result, one should expect overfitting to happen. And uh, so remember, you, we, we have talked in previous lectures about overfitting and uh, regularization, for instance, as one way of reducing overfitting. So the same could happen in, uh, when we're working with neural networks. So there are several approaches in order to make sure that uh, when training neural nets, you don't overfit. So one is, again, regularization, which as you've seen before, what you do is that you add a regularization term to your uh, loss, right? So you, uh, you make sure that the magnitude of the weights is not larger, is not too large, and you have this coefficient here that uh, tells you how much weight you want to give to this regularization. And again, this is, this is, uh, this is a parameter that one can uh, pick using cross-validation. But uh, when working with neural networks, the problem is that even doing one round of training is usually pretty expensive, so you don't want to repeat it as they, if, if, unless you have to, right? So if you want to remember how, how we set lambda, we tried different values of lambda, um, and we basically looked at how they performed uh, using cross-validation, and then we picked the best one, right? So that was, that was the idea when we wanted to pick the coefficient. But if you want to do that with neural networks, because the training itself is expensive, you have to do this multiple times, so this is not really uh, very efficient in practice. So there are other uh, ways of uh, avoiding overfitting. The first one is to um, make sure you do not, you, you do early stopping. And what I mean by that is instead of allowing to, al allowing the stochastic gradient descent to converge, you stop it earlier than that. And there is also another idea called dropout regularization. This is a more recent idea, um, and we are going to talk about both of them. So let me see how much time we have before the break. Okay, we have a couple more minutes, so I'm going to talk about early stopping. Okay. So remember that uh, if you use a stochastic gradient descent uh, in order to learn the parameters of the neural networks and you allow it to converge, you could potentially overfit, and one theoretical reason for that is the universal approximator, uh, the, the <coughs> is the universal uh, approximation, uh, approximation theorem, which says that even when you have just one hidden layer, if, uh, if you have enough hidden units, you can approximate any function, no matter how complex that function is. Given enough units, you can approximate it. Right? So even, even uh, forgetting about deep neural nets, even if you have a one-layer neural net, there is uh, the possibility of overfitting. Uh, so the idea of early stopping is that you don't allow gradient descent to explore the full parameter space, and instead you monitor the error on a validation set and stop the gradient descent when the loss on the validation set starts going up. So 
What do I mean by that? So again, here we have iterations of gradient descent, right? We, here we have the loss, let's say. So we know that the error on training should hopefully go down, right? If we pick the learning rate properly. So this is uh, on training data. Which should be monotone, hopefully. You also keep track of the error on a validation set. So the error on that validation set does not need to go down monotonically, it will in fact at some point start going up. And that is a sign of overfitting. So the idea, so again, this is error on validation set. So the idea is that the idea of early stopping is that you keep monitoring the error both on your training data and your test data and you basically want to stop here. When the error on the validation set starts going up. Just notice that, you know, there could be, you don't want to do this immediately right after the error on the validation set goes up. Like for instance, you don't want to end here, right? So this is, this is not when you want to stop gradient descent. But you want to, you know, you want to keep track of the movement and stop when you see that there is a significant, you know, there is a significant, yeah. yeah. You basically make sure you don't overfit on the test set. Uh, on the green one, yes. So basically, as, when, the, when the green curve starts going up, that is a sign of overfitting. You are basically, what, you, what the stochastic gradient descent is that it is trying to learn patterns in the training data that might not be present in the test data, and as a result, the error on the test data keeps going up instead of down, right? Sure, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Again, like there could be, there could be uh, other test sets that, uh, you know, on which this curve looks different. In fact, for any test uh, set that you, uh, that for any test data set that you choose, this plot is going to look slightly different. But the hope is that if this test uh, set and the training data set are, are all coming from the same distribution, the, the trends should be similar. So that's, that's pretty much the hope. But again, like this function is not going to look exactly the same for different test sets, right? Okay, so that, that, is, that is the idea, and I guess with that we can, we can take a quick break, and we're going to resume in 15 minutes. Okay. Okay, so just a quick recap of what we've been talking about. So we have been talking about different strategies in order to avoid overfitting when uh, training neural nets. So we have so far talked about regularization. We have talked about early stopping in which you monitor the error on a validation set and you stop the gradient descent as soon when uh, the, the error on the validation set starts to decrease, uh, starts to increase. So. The next uh, approach that we are going to talk about, uh, which is a, a pretty recent one and is uh, pretty successful in practice usually, is what is called dropout regularization. So the idea behind dropout regularization is as follows. So when uh, you train neural nets uh, with uh, many parameters uh, and many hidden units, what's 
what's possible and often happens is that these units start specializing to certain patterns in the uh, training data, right? So sometimes this is good because these are patterns that are also going to be present in your training data and you do want the network to pick that up. But sometimes that is not very good because these are too specific of patterns that the, neuro, that the, the hidden unit is trying to pick up from the input data. And so the idea is that uh, the idea of dropout regularization is that you want to make sure that uh, you don't rely too heavily on any single hidden unit. And uh, the way it works is that uh, during the training time, what you do is that you randomly pick some units uh, and you basically remove them from the network altogether, remove the units and the weights uh, associated with them, and uh, you do your forward and backward propagation without these units, and in fact, you do the update and, uh, predict and, and prediction making this stuff, assuming that these don't even exist in the network, right? So by doing this, you make sure that no individual unit is going to play a significant role in specifying your uh, output, and uh, it doesn't no single hidden unit is going to specialize to patterns in the uh, training data that are not going to be present in test data. So that is, that is basically the idea of dropout regularization. You have this parameter P here. In this particular example, we're assuming this parameter is one half. For each of these hidden units with probability one half, you're going to drop them, right? And uh, you're going to train using, uh, uh, you are going to continue your training in this particular iteration without these hidden units. So uh, this, is, this is how you train neural nets with dropout regularization, but how do you evaluate them on the test data? So remember again that in the training time with some probability P, a hidden unit is not even going to be present, uh, both in evaluation and, you know, in, um, it, 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 in that iteration, it's, it's going to be uh, absent from the network altogether. So when you want to evaluate the learned network on a new data set, on the test data set, you could potentially simulate the same process, right? So after you're done with training, you are left with this network and uh, the weights, associated, uh, the, the weights associated with each of these edges, right? And given a new feature set X, when you want to evaluate it on the network, what you can do again is that you can go ahead and drop some of the units with probability P, and then do forward propagation to, uh, to predict the output for that particular feature, right? Yep. You're not choosing them uh, deterministically, you're choosing them randomly. So let's say, so, so uh, let's say this is, this is the, this is one snapshot of one particular part of the network, right? So I have this unit and I have a work W1, W2, blah, blah, right? So at training time, uh, I, in each iteration, I dropped this unit with probability P, so I'm going to do exactly that when I'm trying to evaluate this network on a new feature uh, vector X, right? So let's say the feature vector is one and two, right? And so I feed that into the network, but then before evaluating it, drop some of the units with probability P. So basically for each unit, I flip a coin with probability P, and if it comes up ahead, I'm going to drop that unit Otherwise, I'm going to keep the unit around. Then I do forward propagation using this feature vector that I have, and I'm going to get an output. So that's the idea, right? So you're basically trying to simulate what you did during training. So that's, that's one idea, but it's not widely used in practice because you are, you are, what you're doing is that you're ignoring part of the network that you've learned. So one thing you could potentially do to fix that is to repeat this process many times. So every time you flip a coin, right? So you are, you are going to remove a different set of the uh, hidden units potentially, right? So you're going to get a different evaluation for the same feature vector. 
Is, is that clear? I see some confused faces. So, so you repeat this multiple times, and you can put that, you you can you somehow combine them. You can take the average or do something else. But again, this is this is uh, this is again not so efficient because you have to do many rounds of forward propagation. What you instead can do is that instead of removing each unit with probability p, you keep all the units present, but you multiply their weights by p, right? So. So in a way, this is also reducing the magnitude of the weights, but in a different way compared to regularization. Okay. Again, this P here is a regularization parameter that you can, you know, you can do cross-validation over to figure out what P works well for the particular network structure um, and uh, training data that you have. So. Here is an illustration of how overfitting looks. So on the left-hand plot, what you can see is the result of training a neural net with, with zero hidden layers, which is the same thing as saying that you're training a linear model, right? So if, if, if you do this for each of your possible classes, which correspond to um, here in this, part, in this example to numbers, so what you, so you are, you are trying, so, it, okay, let me, let me first give you a, a background of what this example is. So let's say we are working with the MNIST data set, right? We are trying to uh, recognize handwritten digits. So one thing you can do is to train a linear model right, on the training data that you have on the MNIST data set. And for each of the possible classes that you might get, which is going to be zero up to nine, right, so for, for each image you want to assign it to one of these classes. So for each one of them you are going to end up with a weight vector, right? So here we are doing something very simple. We are, we are training a weight vector for each class, right? So if you, if you visualize these weight vectors, this is what you're going to get. So, so as you can see, you can pretty much see the numbers, right? So basically, what? Uh, let's focus on the first one here, right? So this is this is supposed to recognize uh, handwritten zeros, and uh, the basically the white pixels correspond to positive uh, values. The black ones correspond to negative, and these gray ones correspond to zeros. This is how this is uh, the weight vector is visualized. And when you want to decide whether a new image is uh, zero or not, what you do is that you, uh, you compute the inner product of this matrix here with this image that you have represented again as a matrix, right? So let's say I have an image that looks like this. I compute the inner product with this one to see how confident my model is that this handwritten digit is a zero. I repeat this for this one as well, for this one and so on, right? This is, this is what we did in multi-class classification. And then pick the, pick the, uh, the digit that we are most confident the handwritten one represents, right? So this is, I'm, I'm basically just describing a very basic learning setting for the MNIST data set. So this is, this is what happens if you just use a very simple linear model, which is um, a, can be thought of as a neural net with zero hidden layers. So now if you instead train a neural net with one hidden unit, so this is one, one uh, particular set of weights that you might get. Right, so you could potentially have more than 10 uh, hidden units, but uh, what you see here is a, a visualization of 10 of these hidden units. So as you can see, again, some of these, like for instance, this one, or this one, or this one, they still seem to be capturing useful information about the handwritten digit. Whereas these ones, right, they look kind of random, and they are signs of overfitting, 
basically these random ones to, to, to our eyes, they look completely random. They don't seem to, you know, they don't seem to re represent any information about the input. But what is probably happening is that this unit, this unit that I visualized here, is probably specializing to very specific patterns in the input data, right? And as a result, like to us, it looks random. It doesn't really look like uh, conveying any information about a handwritten digit. So basically, this is, this is a visualization just trying to show you how overfitting might look. So the, so the accuracy of this first model is not that great. It's around... Uh, 37 or a point 37 or something, which is not that good. It's just a bit better than random guessing. This other one is much higher, is 0.8. But as you can see, you know, it uh, uh, it looks like it's overfitting. So on a different data set, it might not work that well. Okay, so. Now, if we apply this idea of dropout regularization in order to make sure our neural net is not overfitting, we are going to get much better, uh, much better learned parameters. So uh, this, is, this, is a, uh, this is from a paper that appeared in JMLR uh, in which they studied the performance of dropout. As you can see, on the x-axis, we have the number of uh, weight updates, and on the y-axis, we have the classification error. Each of these, uh, each different color corresponds to different initialization. As you can see, you know, depending on the initialization, you are going to get different curves, but with and without dropout, you are going to see very significant, uh, the, there is a significant gap between the performance with and without dropout regularization, no matter what your initialization is. Right, so, so this is basically showing you how adding the dropout regularization to your learning process is going to improve the classification error you're going to get. Okay, so here is also a more visual representation of the performance of dropout on, uh, again, for, for recognizing handwritten digits. So on the left side, you can see without dropout regularization, you are going to get these random looking uh, uh, units, right? So the, your units seem to be adapting to random, uh, to, to noise basically. They're trying to represent, the, the, they're, they're trying to model noise, which is, which is not good and is a sign of overfitting. But when you add dropout regularization with a parameter 0.5, you are going to get a much clearer picture. So in this picture, as you can see, you basically are seeing different units uh, specializing to different strokes, right? So when you're trying to write a uh, digit, you are using strokes, right? So th th these, uh, these units each seem to be trying to capture part of that. And that, that, is, that is certainly a better and more understandable model. All right, so that's it for our discussion of regularization. Next, we are going to talk about uh, how we want to how we want to be robust to certain transformation of the input data. So let me let me just just to make sure we are all on the same page. So so far, we have talked about a few different problems that might arise when we are trying to train neural nets. We talked about setting the parameters of the stochastic uh, gradient descent. Um, for instance, uh, setting the learning parameter. We talked about how the local optimal look like and how we, uh, we uh, uh, some strategies that usually, uh, usually lead us in the direction of a good local minima. And finally, we talked about regularization. We know that neural networks might uh, overfit. In order to avoid overfitting, we went over a couple of strategies. Uh, the latest one being dropout, which uh, helped us make sure with neural networks we don't do overfitting. So that is, that is what we've covered so far. Now we are going to switch gears and uh, talk about a slightly different, but again, uh, practically relevant uh, issue when talking about 
neural networks, and that is uh, that is uh, the desire to be robust again certain against a certain uh, transformation of the input data. And again, the canonical example I would like you to have in mind for this part of the lecture is image recognition, right? So suppose again you wanna you wanna figure uh, you wanna classify handwritten digits. If you it's, there are certain transformations that you ideally would like your, uh, your model to be, uh, you, you want your prediction to be robust against. For instance, if I have uh, a hand-written digit representing two like this, and I have another one like this, I have another one like this, ideally you want all of them to be classified as a two. Right, so in other words, you want your prediction to be a translation or shift invariant. There are other uh, transformations that in this particular example you might wanna be robust against. For instance, you might wanna be robust against rotation, let's say. Yet another example is that you want to be robust against the scale. Uh, So even when you know that you're working with handwritten digits, ideally you would like to make sure your prediction doesn't uh, is not affected by these. If if you transfer your data using translation, rotation, or scale, right? So another example is uh, another example you can think of is in the context of speech recognition. So uh, there you might want to be robust against uh, high or low pitch, right? So regardless of whether a woman or a man is saying the word, you want the classifier to be accurate. You might want to be robust against the speed with which different people talk, right? Some, some people might pronounce a word very quickly, some people might be slow. So these are, these are certain transformations of the input that you might want to be uh, robust against. Okay, so uh, in what follows, we are going to talk about how we should take these invariances into account and how we can make sure our prediction is robust against uh, these uh, invariances. So one, uh, one possible approach that uh, has been around uh, is to use, um, has been around in uh, computer vision and in uh, speech recognition, are using handcrafted features that uh, represent the data and are robust against uh, certain invariances. For instance, uh, for image recognition, there is this class of features called SIFT. I'm not going to talk about them in detail, but they stand for scale, Invariance feature transformation. Uh, in the context of uh, speech recognition, there is this class of features called Septrum. And so this is for speech recognition. So this is one way. One way you can uh, you can make sure you take invariances into account. Basically, you know there are these hand-designed features that you can work with, and the features are uh, made up. They are designed so that they are they already uh, make the prediction uh, invariant to certain transformation. So another another approach is to encourage the model itself to learn specific invariances. For instance, what you can do is that 
You can add a bunch of new instances to your uh, training data corresponding to all these transformations. For instance, if you have this in your training data, you might want to add this, this, and this also to your training data, basically representing the same data point uh, shifted around, the same data point scaled, the same data point rotated, right? So for any data point, you might want to add a bunch of uh, other data points for, to your training data set in order to make your model learn that these are all the same things, right? So that, that is one approach, but again, it, it, it is not a very efficient approach because usually the training data set is already huge and you don't want it to add all these things to it. So a different approach that people have uh, used so far is using the special uh, loss functions and special regularization terms. We are not going to discuss them here in, uh, in the class. The last approach that uh, has been recently proposed and used widely is making sure that the uh, invariance that we uh, the, the invariance in question is baked into the structure of the neural network itself, and this is what convolutional neural networks are supposed to do. So, uh, convolutional neural nets. Are basically potentially deep feed forward artificial neural networks uh, for specialized applications. In particular, they have been successfully applied to image recognition, and that is the canonical example we are going, uh, with which we are going to learn about uh, convolutional neural nets. And at a high level, what uh, they do is that they make a certain degree of translation or shift invariance to the model. And we are going to see just in a moment how that works. But at a high level, this is done by sharing weights uh, between uh, hidden units uh, and uh, between layers. So, how, uh, so the way they work is that Let's, let's, let's actually think about an example. Let's consider a, a handwritten digit as your input, right? And suppose you want to you wanna train a neural net in order to classify that. So if, you're, if your handwritten digit has, let's say, a million pixels, and you have a, a, a neural net with just one layer and, let's say, like a million hidden units, you already have a million to the power of two different parameters. And this is even hard to store, let alone optimize for, right? So instead, what convolutional neural nets are doing is that they say, instead of having all these parameters around, let's do the following. So uh, each hidden unit in the network is going to correspond to a small patch on the image. And uh, the weights are going to apply only to the, the a weight vector is uh, correspond the, the weight vector going to that particular hidden unit is going to only apply to that particular patch. It's going to be zero everywhere else, right? And uh, and the uh, and all these patches must be treated similarly. So if I apply a weight vector uh, a weight vector w to this patch of the email, the same should be applied to this other patch. So at a high level, the, this is the idea. So if you think about it, this is going to drastically decrease the number of parameters. So in a way, by doing this, by asking uh, the weight vectors to look like this, we are making the number of parameters much, much smaller, right? Uh, OK, so when, when we have less parameters, we can, ins we can allow the network to be deeper, and we can preserve certain uh, spatial information about the image. And I'm going to talk about that shortly uh, in more detail. So, so that, is, that is the high level idea behind convolutional neural nets. And uh, they are, by the way, sometimes uh, called CNNs for short. CNN. Uh, Okay, so, so at a high level, a convolutional neural net has 
and architecture as the one you see in the picture. So I want to emphasize that this is an overly simplified architecture for, an, uh, for a convolutional neural net, but uh, I hope from it you can get the overall idea. So basically you have an input layer, you feed it to a convolution layer, which I'm going to tell you exactly what it does in a second. It basically, uh, it, it basically represents different patches of the image, tries to extract certain information from the image patches, then you could have pooling layers in order to make sure your representation doesn't blow up you, to make the representation smaller. You can have multiple of these convolution plus pooling layers, and then you can have a bunch of fully connected layers, and at the end you are going to have the output layer. Right? So compared to what we have talked so far, so, so far we have basically talked about a neural net that has an input layer, a bunch of fully connected layers, and then the output layer. So here we have this convolution and pooling uh, layers added, and these are meant to capture certain information about the image. Okay, so next we are going to talk about the convolution operation and pooling. So for the convolution part, I find that maybe doing an example is much easier than trying to explain it without one. So let's, let's assume that we have an image. Uh, again, let's say we have a handwritten digit, right? So we represent this as a matrix of pixels, right? So for instance, to be, to make the example simpler, let's say, it's going to be a uh, seven by seven matrix of pixels. We are going to, uh, the, the input representing this is going to be a seven by seven by three matrix, and the three is uh, because we are going to have three color channels, right? So RGB, red, uh, uh, Three color channels. And at each one of these entries, we are going to get the density of that particular color at that particular pixel. Uh, I, should, I should use intensity, not density. <laughs> So, so, so is it clear how I'm representing the, ima the image, right? So one can think of the image being represented by a 3D matrix instead of a 2D image, right? So uh, one could, um, for, forgetting about convolutional neural networks for a second, if you want to use a fully connected neural network to, uh, to, uh, to classify these images, what you are going to do is that you're basically going to flatten this matrix, right? You're going to feed all, that, uh, all the pixel information in a uh, very, you know, lengthy vector into the matrix, and by doing that, you're, you're pretty much, you know, uh, you're, you're going to lose a lot of information about the spatial characteristics of uh, the image. So the idea behind convolutional neural nets is that you want to... Uh, you, you want to preserve some of the information uh, about the spatial structure of the image. So, we, so the goal is to do this by extracting features from patches of the image. So by patch, I mean like a certain sub-matrix of this, right? So this represents an image patch. So uh, the way you do this is by applying a filter, which is a weight matrix with the same length as the patch, right? So for instance, let's say, so this is the image, this is the filter, and let's say the filter is four by four, by three. So the depth of the filter has to be the same as the depth of the image, right? And uh, 
the way we apply the filter into the image is that we compute the inner product of this filter to the image patch, and we are going to get a number, right? And then we are going to slide the filter over the image. Next, we are going to look at this patch, for instance, right? This patch here. We are going to look at this one, multiply it, uh, compute the inner product of the filter with that patch, get another number, and then once we are done with this row, we are going to come down, look at this patch, and so on and so forth. It's kind of like trying to brush the image, right? So, so that's how we apply a filter. And the goal of this filter is to extract certain information from that image patch. For instance, one filter could focus on color, right? Trying to figure out whether there is, uh, whether this patch has a lot of green in it or a lot of red in it and so on. Another filter could focus on detecting edges of the uh, image. Uh, another one could focus on, I don't know, texture or whatever. So different filters, any question? So different filters correspond to different, uh, different uh, information that we want to extract from the image patch. So this operation that I just described, computing the uh, inner product of the filter and the image is called the convolution step, right? So uh, it is not the same thing as uh, convolution you might have heard about in math, uh, but it is like it is uh, traditionally called convolution. Again, like don't confuse it with the. If if you know another definition of convolution, it is not the same thing as that one. Okay, so. If you do this, you're gonna get a new representation of the image. If you compute the convolution between the image and the filter, you're going to get a new representation of the image. And you can potentially apply different filters to an image. Again, at a high level, the goal of these filters is to extract information from image patches. <clears throat> So in this particular example we just talked about, uh, I assume that every time I move the filter by just one pixel, right? But you can imagine situations in which I move the filter by two, three, and so on. So the length of this step that I move the filter by is called the stride, right? So if, if for instance, in this particular example, if I have a four by four filter and apply it to this particular image, I'm going to end up with a four by four uh, matrix, right? Uh, so, so, so notice that here, by applying this four by four filter to this seven by seven image, I ended up with a reduced sizes representation of the image. And uh, if you don't want that to happen, if you want to maintain the size of the image, what you could do is you can add a layer of padding. What that means is that if this is your image, you add a layer of zeros around it, right? In order to end up with an image with the same size. So we are going to talk about that in the next example as well. So as you can see, like the gray, the gray part is the padding, right? So here you have a five by five image, three color channels, right? Representing our uh, GMB. You have a three by three by three filter, right? And the way you do the uh, convolution is as follows. So th th this is basically a three by three matrix and we are representing each, uh, uh, we, are, we are representing it like this, right? So what you do is that you compute the inner product of these two matrices, these two and these two. I, I, I'd like you to imagine this as a 3D process, but because that's hard to show on the slides, 
So basically, this is a three by three by th uh, three matrix, and we have a three by three by three patch, image patch, and we are basically computing the inner product of these two, right? So that can be written as the sum of the inner product of uh, this part of the filter with this part of the patch, this part of the filter with this part of the patch, and so on. So if you, you compute the inner product, you're going to have zero, uh, zero by zero plus zero by zero plus zero by one, zero by minus one, two by one, zero by one, zero by zero, zero minus one, and zero minus one. So the sum is going to be two for this particular uh, part of the filter. Again, repeating this for this other part of the patch and filter, we are going to get a sum equal to, so we have zeros here, the only parts that we need to compute are one by zero, again zero we don't have to worry about, minus one by zero, so the sum is going to be zero. And again for this one, let's see, so we have zero everywhere, just two here, so two by minus one, the sum is going to be minus two. So is that clear what I'm doing? So, and so now if you sum these up, the total sum is going to be zero. So that is going to be the inner product of your three by three by three filter and the three by three by three image patch you were looking at, right? And this is, this is the zero you have here. Now if you have a stride of one and you keep moving this, Right, and compute the inner product, you are going to get this value minus one here. Again, if you move it, you're going to get minus two, and so on and so forth. Right, and you can have uh, more than uh, one filter. You can have uh, two filters. So, let me see if I, yep. Uh, let's see. You're, you're right, yes, strike two. So basically the point of uh, padding is to make sure you retain information about the boundary and by applying the filter you don't reduce the size of image by too much. So you could still have padding that makes the image smaller even though you have applied padding you might get a smaller representation of the image. What? Uh, so, the reason, well, let's, let's talk about that offline. I need to have an, another example to show you why you need zeros, okay? All right, so before we run out of time, I want to quickly tell you how uh, we can compute the dimensions of the resulting representation if you're given a n by n image, right? So we have an n by n image with three color channels. We have a filter that is f by f with three uh, depth three. Suppose I add a padding layer of size p. In this previous example, p was one, right? So and suppose the stride if of length uh, s. So in the previous. Uh, Example, the stride, the number of pixels that we jumped every time was two. The padding layer was one. N was, let's see what it was. So N was five, the image was five by five. And the filter was three by three, right? So F was three. So what is the resulting representation we are going to get for uh, applying this filter to this image? you can compute the dimensions of this resulting representation using the following formula. N plus 2P, so N is the dimension. 2P, because you add uh, padding to both sides, right? And then minus F, the length of your filter, divided by the stride, plus 1. So this is this is going to be, let's call this, uh, I don't know, L, right? So L, the length is going to be this. And for this previous example that we talked about, what is that value? It's going to be 5 
plus 2, which is 7, minus f, 3, this will be 4, divided by this try 2, 2, plus 1, it's going to be 3. And that is exactly what you see here. So if you have multiple filters, in this particular example, we assumed we had two filters applied to the image, you're going to get a matrix with depth equal to the number of filters, uh, M. Okay, so I'm quickly running out of time, so let's cover pulling next session. And we're gonna continue the discussion about convolutional neural nets. Uh, after wrapping up that discussion, we are going to have a tutorial for how one can uh, use uh, Keras to implement neural nets easily, uh, convolutional neural nets easily. And then we're gonna wrap up the discussion about uh, supervised learning. Thank you, see you tomorrow.